Okay, welcome back. Hour number three on this Monday, and that means our Fukushima update. Seen Fukushima in the news lately? Heard any radio information? Any radio stories, interviews about Fukushima? No. Seen it on CNN? No. Has it slowed any? No. It, in fact, is getting worse all the time. Worse and worse. I've got a story up there. It was on E&E News, one of the uh, primary sources. It, it, it's not what it used to be, but it's still got a few stories. Heavily radioactive Fukushima food was found in the U.S. shortly after the disaster. No one in here was told about it because the EPA says the levels were really far below anything we need to worry about. Of course, we know how they lied about everything. So that's one. You can see these stories right at the top center column. And Fukushima remains the biggest catastrophe in recorded history. Japan uh, is getting to be crazier. Uh, they're trying to force South Korea now to take their radioactive fish, which is kind of interesting. They are now saying that tritium, if it was recovered from the plant, Daiichi, could be used to propel automobiles. Talk about reaching for straws in the wind. It's wild. Take a look at the stories. Keep yourself up to date. No one else is going to do it. In the mainstream media, this story doesn't exist anymore. Yochi, can you hear me all right? We barely got you this time. Yeah, I can hear you fine. Oh, good. Yeah, we- uh, I can hear you fine on this side. Yeah, the, uh, last week we had this. Satellites were down, I believe, because of those solar flares. Again, you read about the coming of the solar flares, but you yeah. probably didn't hear that. They probably shut down a lot of communication satellites. Uh, to prevent damage to them. You'd think so, that they would make an announcement about is, that. You would think so. And I, I went to the phone company, two phone companies, and they both didn't know what was going on. You know? No one knew. It was just, I guess there's not that many international customers. Some big corporations, they use trunk lines. You know, they use, uh, uh, right. they don't just rely on satellites. They have access to cables that run through Australia. But the normal, you know, uh, cheapo phone companies, you know, uh, they just rely on the, uh, the quickie uh, satellite. I see. They were apparently all shut down. Because I did try to call you from this side. Nothing happened. So there's a lot of stuff that's very important to people, you know, that doesn't get in the news. You know, like uh, Yahoo often, the U.S. often goes down on this side yeah. because of the, uh, of the disturbances in space uh, from the you know, solar flares ejected from the sun. And uh, we picked them up in Hong Kong, places like that. But uh, no one on that side, of course, the ocean knows what's happening. You know, U.S. in many ways is a very insular country, you know. So, Correct. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, most sure. communications within the country, and uh, whereas other parts of the world are more dependent on the U.S., uh, U.S. markets and so on, and so are more sensitive. So, very, so again, uh, a lot of scientific fact that we need to know, yeah. we don't know, you know, yeah. and we're not informed of. And we have to pick through and try to discern, you know, uh, look at the, Science stories that no one really reads and, and try to figure out what happened. Yeah. As the Ebola case, and of course, as Fukushima, this whole notion of, you know, they just announced in very technical terms, let's say the Tokyo Electric Power Company, that they're removing part of the coming from Reactor 1. Yeah. Now, Reactor 1 is covered by the giant, uh, sort of, uh, they're like squares. Of, uh, yeah. auto- yeah, exactly. These vast, they're like these long pieces that stretch across, uh, and wrap the building. And they took one off the middle, opening up, let's say, one side in the top of the building, or two sides in the top of the building. Now, the purpose of the cover, of the covering, if we recall, when they announced they were going to cover it, and we thought it was pretty crazy, was to contain the radioactive... Well, that's what we were told. Uh, you know, we were led uh, to believe releases. that. They were going to keep all the gases and emissions inside. Exactly. Now they just, you know, in like a three-paragraph press release, tell us they removed the cover. Now, so we've seen a year's worth of buildup inside there. Really? Where did it is, go? Is that, is that not a logical... Dis- exactly. <laughs> exactly. Now, it's over here by anyone, now. In the Pacific, or on the other side of the Pacific, get any fair warning that, oh, by the way, atmospheric radiation is going to skyrocket by thousands of times because we just opened up 
a covering over a reactor that but not not to worry yochi because they've raised the acceptable limits remember by on orders of uh, 20 to 27,000 yeah. times in some cases depending on the radionuclide yeah I mean, well you have to remember workers were, could not get inside by any means into <laughs> into that space without removing the cover so you know right. uh, we're way beyond any kind of limits there it's vast amounts have been released no discussion on how much was in there what levels were inside pressurization inside there none of that you know the uh you know the isotope content uh nothing nothing you know so we are in a very very bad position i think uh, in terms of information wise of not getting and and unfortunately the information we're getting very very bad yeah uh, we're not getting anything uh, here's here's the story uh yochi yeah. in uh I've got it up there. Um, a professor says, mm-hmm. Fukushima has destroyed our lives, and it can destroy history mm-hmm. itself. It's very hard to imagine a future beyond Fukushima. It is so uncontainable. And the filmmaker said the meltdowns yeah, well, have yeah, opened yeah, up yeah. a fissure in time and space. The horror of radiation menaces the future is now in the present. And it just goes on and on. I mean, uh, th- things... Let me read a little bit what this guy says. Uh, his name yeah. is uh, uh-huh. Ann J- Jalika Sagar. Uh, things have gotten much uh-huh. worse, he says. And at the same time that things have gotten worse, you have an accelerated form of secrecy relating to the level of contamination in food products and in the ocean. We were interested in the politics of how disposable this population has now become. And that's very well said. Where the threat of earthquakes Mm -hmm. could possibly contaminate the whole of Japan, which has in fact happened, it could happen any day, any hour. Another guy said, uh, we made a distinction between the nature of an accident and the nature of a catastrophe. The idea is that an accident is located in time and space. The earthquake and tsunami are a terrible, tragic instance, but they are accidents. The catastrophe is potentially unlimited in time and space. Mm -hmm. The meltdowns Mm -hmm. are a catastrophe that opened up a fissure in time and space, both in the past and in the present and in the future, so that what seems to be past is no longer past, but becomes present in a new way. And similarly, what hasn't happened yet is menaced by this moment we are living in now. The horror of inhabiting radiation is that it menaces the future in the present, and it makes the future hostile in the present. Well, it's well said, you know. Uh, Yeah, it is one of these, Fukushima is a collapsing point of time in which we can review all the key elements, memories of the past, and uh, projections of the future. Of uh, It doesn't take a lot to extrapolate from Fukushima where we're heading to. And uh, Yeah, are you still there, Yochi? I think we lost him. All right, well, we lost him. We'll try and get him back. I, I don't know. This is a very strange. We had so many problems. When he's in Hong Kong, no problem. Thailand... We have problems. Anyway, we'll get him back on in just a minute. Tenuous communications, as they say. We're going to go right now up to British Columbia and say hello to our colleague and uh, researcher, friend, hero, uh, Dana Durnford, who is up. And Adam, let's see, uh, see if we can get Dana on the line. Are you there, Dana? Hello, Dana. Are you there? All right. We don't have Dana either. Well, that's interesting. All right, I'm listening here. Yochi, are you there yet? No. Well, okay. We had Dana standing by. He was there. Yochi was there, and then he was gone. But he'll be back. Okay. What I'll do while we're getting them back, hang on a second, is uh, I'm going to go back. There's another story. All right, we've got somebody back on. I can't tell which one. Who's there? Dana. Hey, Dana. We lost both of you. This is really crazy tonight. I don't know. Somebody doesn't want us to get this thing going, but we will. We were talking about some quotes from Japan that were 
quite remarkable. Were you able to hear them? No, um, that, I got some of it when you were talking. You were just starting to read down about... Um, yeah, the, well, the one guy made some really yeah. good points about how an accident is one thing, but a catastrophe is something entirely different. An accident is something that is stuck in time and space. It happens, it's in the books. A catastrophe, like Fukushima, is in the past, 311, in the present, today, and in the future, unlimited. And it's not being talked about at all in the mainstream media over here. It's out of the headlines. It's not there. It must have been fixed. Everything must be just fine. <laughs> That's what the average person would say if you even ask them. Uh, most people don't want to hear about it. But what they've done here, as you well know, is raise the so-called safe limits of radiation to levels that are so high now that we can be deluged and bombed with Fukushima radionuclides and still be, quote, safe. And the EPA, with a straight face, semi-straight, can say, not to worry, you're within the safe guidelines. Same thing the Japan government did to the people over there. Yochi, are you back? Everybody. No, he's okay, not back. Okay, I think you can oh, hear me there. by now again. I got you there, and Dana is on the line. Yeah, we just got I'm Dana on the line, too. Good, excellent, excellent, good. All right, I was just asking Dana to uh, go ahead and give us an update on his progress. What's going on up there, my friend? Yeah, I want to hear this. Yeah, absolutely. And out of touch. Yeah, well, uh, it's a pretty short one. We went up and got on the ferry, and there was a whole bunch of people got kicked off the ferry because we didn't have photo ID. And I was like, oh, my goodness, I didn't have photo ID. And so we couldn't get on the ferry because it's over a five-hour ride. Now, I had to take a ferry, a short one, to get back. <laughs> and there's no IDs. So why did they take an ID? So that means i got to drive 1,200 miles up the coastline, or not up the coastline, but up through the mountains and the snow passes and everything to get up there, or take that run back across and up to the island, just want to drive around and hit a few places along the way. Did you go up into snow. the snow? Yeah, gonna go have, we're going to winterize, get all snow tires and chains and everything. And uh, All right, well, what about, the, uh, what about the boat? It's crazy. Yeah, we're going to drag that up there into the snow. And that's fine. That's Canadian winter. We we got one shop in mall here. We all shop out of that snow all the time. That's a joke. Um, but no, we'll drive. I drove that many times in the winter time. But we're not into the winter time yet. But we're going to have the equipment just in case. And go ahead and go do it that way. Because that's really weird, though. I can't wrap my mind around why I have to have a photo ID when I gave him a certified check and reserved it. And he never told me anything about it. And then they put the money back on my card so they know it's me. They gave me a refund, so they know it's me. Oh, uh, that's ridiculous. But you won't let me on it because they didn't have a photo ID. I said, well, you just give me the money back. I, it doesn't make any sense, right? Where was the but, ferry uh, going to take you, one. Dana? I'm not following. I wasn't the only one. Where was, it, where was the ferry going to take you that you needed to go? It was going to take me to Prince Rupert, and then I was going to get another ferry, which was on a uh, short ride over to the Queen Charlotte Islands. Now, the funny thing about this was I found out after was I could have got I could have took the ferry to Bella Bella, which is less than five hours away, and then I would have had to wait for a week and catch the next ferry and catch it up to Clem 2 or Shearwater or something, and then wait another week and then catch the ferry without no ID. <laughs> <laughs> you can't make it up, see? You can't make that stuff up. No. And I mean, no. we spend a couple of weeks just doing that whole coastline, the Brownies Pass, that whole area, and we were all geared to go. We just put a new cabin on the boat. That was 12000 and Okay, you got, go hold on. And do it. You, got a ca you, you got the cabin on the boat, so the yeah, Zodiac is now go. more weatherized. Go do that. How is yeah, that? It's gorgeous. How are you taking the boat on the ferry with you? Well, you just tow it on with the trailer, and that's standard out here in BC. There's a lot of uh, a lot of boats moving around here on that mm -hmm. coastline. Everybody's got a boat in the gardens up here, small boats, right? And so they, there's a lot of. There used to be a, because I took that ferry, I don't know, probably a hundred times, and it was never, you know, it was always loaded. It was never an issue, and it was straight up, and you get off the ferry and get on another boat and you go to work. Because we used to leave our boats up north. Rather than bring them all the way down the coast when you come, you get a bit of time up. But I used to do 100 day trips on that ocean up there. So it was 100 days out there in those islands. You come ashore and you usually wouldn't even come down there. But if you did, you come down on the ferry 
and I had based myself on Vancouver Island. That was a kickoff for the North Coast. And I originally done the North Coast because it was all what I call virgin territory. No one's that ever dove it. There was hardly any licenses up there back in those days. Right. And so it was a very pristine place. And that's why I fell in love with it so much. It was just a fantastic coastline. So what we're going to do is we'll, I said, I'll take two weeks off because I've been on the road for 60 days on the ocean out there hitting that coastline, just worn out. And I'll upload all the pictures that I took and in the next uh, two weeks, and then I'll, I'll tidy up everything, get everything winterized, and we'll head off again. Um, there's, uh, there's a Fukushima symposium going on in Texas on uh, November 15th and 16th. I'm a guest on that one, so I'll be going in on Skype. So I'll take, so I'll be leaving the oh, day after that or so. Uh, so that'll be interesting. I'm a speaker. They got me as a guest speaker for that. And the whole point was, you know, we never found any of the species that we would expect to find. And folks not familiar with it, I'll just give them a quick rundown. There should be 6,500 species of invertebrates without the backbones. They're like shrimp, but, you know, they're like flat creatures. We never found any of them in the tidal pools or in the nursery of the ocean itself on the shoreline. And there should be around uh, 480 species of worms. And you would find a whole whack of them in the shoreline, and you would find five or six on a little rock the size of your hand, and there'd be all kinds of other little species in the vertebrates. There, nothing. The rocks were naked. And then, as you go down the list, of course, the sea anemones, which totally dominated every rock. When we used to go into a rock pile to go diving, we would look for white sea anemones, and, and, and we knew there was a rock there because you would sure, see them of course. first. Yeah. And you don't see them. You're actually looking for rocks. And I've never done that before. I've always, you know, year after year after year. So you, in other words, your white, your white sea anemone would be a little beacon showing you where the rocks are, but they're gone. And they'd be out of the water, but they'd be at right, yeah, all the way down. And then you have the starfish, only finding uh, five species of that. There was only five species of the sea anemones, by the way, folks, out of 78 species. And the list keeps going down. All the species where there's multiple types of the species, but there are individual species, we only find at best two or three of them four or five of them, and the whole coastline that we covered over 60 days. That is incredible. And the, the health of the ocean has this next two weeks gone up, load all the underwater videos. We'll edit all that down and get some really good stuff up. I think that's really going to blow people away. It's just shocking to see how sick it is and how thin everything is and how hopeless it looks. It can't recover because we can't stop Fukushima. Even if we stop Fukushima, it couldn't recover. It only takes 130 days across the ocean every day beyond it was another plume. And, of course, that's liberated through exactly. that protection and evaporation and everything yeah. else as you cover over and over. So, uh, my, uh, my, so generally, we need to do it just to have a debate, I guess. Okay. Yeah, my next question over. is one I've asked before, but I'm very interested in the locals and what they're telling you, what they're seeing, and they must be aware of this. I know last year the salmon fishermen yeah. got together and did their own cesium testing on salmon because the feds wouldn't do it, and the industry didn't want to hear about it. Right. And it was just a small group of, of heroic salmon fishermen that stuck their necks right. out and put their money up, and they came back with results that weren't good. It's scary. They're cesium. scary, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Real stuff. So what's going on with the locals up there? I think the locals is quite amazing. I say eight out of ten people engaged me in the conversation itself. Eight out of ten people, and they all had the same thing. I thought it was plugged, and that was a common word, whether they stick their finger in it and plug it or not. But they all, I thought they had that all plugged up. But once you once you got into the conversation, they would ask you pertinent questions on what you were saying. They weren't trying to walk away. They weren't trying to avoid the conversation. They were actually asking pertinent questions. And, of course, as you t- I was talking to engineers and welders and all these other people, and they, they, those guys, that was the type of people that would really hammer you with the, with the proper question. And I thought that was quite, that made me feel good in a way that there was hope because people really did get it. They asked, as I talked to them and they asked me questions, I told them that. Then they would ask a great question each time, eight out of ten times I seen that. And the other ones seemed like they're vaguely lost, but you can see in Fukushima, really? It's still going on. And so most people think it is plugged up. A lot of that's got to do with Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution going up telling everybody that there's only a few leaks left there and that it is plugged up for the last three and a half years. And Woods uh, Hole is, boys, is, Woods Hole, just for our listeners, is, is not our friend, uh, in this, in this no. fight to bring reality and truth to people. 
Uh, it is uh, tragically, obviously, playing on the other side of the fence, pretending to be our friend, and they are not. Uh, it's rather like UC Berkeley. Now, there are some good people at UC Berkeley, but unfortunately, UC Berkeley is tied to the government, tied to the military-industrial complex, and, of course, the powers that be, ultimately. And they are not going to tell us anything. They're doing this uh, Kelp Watch 2014 survey, which is going to be a complete fraud. Uh, we know what to expect. So the only thing we're really getting by way of a measurement of of the amount of damage, certainly from British Columbia North, is what Dana has been doing, in case you folks are new to the program. No one else is doing anything up there. And you're going up into the snow. Are you going to take snow samples and see what's coming down in the precipitation there? Yeah, this time going up is going to be completely different. I got me, I already got it worked out to, we're going to pre-plan where we're going to. We're going to contact the local newspaper and put advertisements in it. Then we're going to have a, a presentation in that community. We're going to rent a place. We're going to go out and meet the natives. Um, and I'm adamant that that is the way I got to go now. I got to ratchet it up. And so I'm going to bring in, I'm going to go, you know, I'll go talk to the local newspapers, local radio stations. I'll personally go there and talk to them and see if I can get someone interested and carry the subject in that community. And we want people to come out and debunk us. That's what we want them to do. We want them to come out and say, you're wrong. Here it is right there. Or we would like the native community and that would be not fun. like it. We're going to go up and ask them, tell them, mm-hmm. you got to come out and show me where you ate all that food from the low tide zones. And people have to understand that on that whole concept. So I know I'm going to have to push it harder and get more documentation. That's what the plan is, to really to really ratchet it up and give everybody an opportunity. And you know how I am. I'll do the presentation properly. Oh, yeah. And, and then when... Jay Cullen and the rest of them shows up from the University of Victoria and tell them it's like bananas, they'll have a few questions for them. Okay. We can All right. take that Stand. away from them. Yeah. Stand by, Dana, in just a second. Yoshi, are you still there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I can barely hear you, but All I'm right. still here. Okay, good. If Hold I on. Dana, right? He said he was up, up by the snow line. Measuring radiation. Is well, we hope. We, yeah, we got to take a break, and when we come back. We'll revisit that for you. So stand by, everybody. We'll come right back. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We are back, and we're talking with Yoshi Shimatsu, who is in Thailand. And Dana Dernford up here in British Columbia. All right, Dana, one other uh, question for you, and Yochi had echoed it. What kind of work do you expect to be able to do by taking snow samples? This is very important at the higher elevations. And if you go, well, we just lost somebody. Who's? <laughs> Yochi. Yochi's gone again. Uh, if you go by somebody's house, Dana, and you do a, a ground reading on the soil, just on the top soil around their house. This is one way you can do it. And it'll read whatever, 35, 40 counts per minute, whatever the baseline there is. And then they say, well, that doesn't look like it's real bad. Go over then to the, the downspout, the rain gutter downspout, and read the, the soil right where the water pours out. It's been pouring out now for almost four years, coming up this March. And read that location and prepare to be amazed. Because that's where it all compiles and intensifies and it builds up there. And I've normal ground readings here. I don't touch the, the inspector to the ground. I put a plastic bag over it so I can read it or I just hold it carefully. But it'll be, you know, 35, 40. And you go over to the downspout, be 150, 160, 400 percent higher. So that's usually something that'll get people's attention. I got 242 um, uh, during that typhoon that came across the end of it, the tail wow. end. Wow, where were you reading? Yeah, what what were you reading? Was- Rain- just rainwater. That was uh, just the moisture in the air. Well, it never stopped raining that whole time, so we were in a campground, and we have a... 242 have just reading the Counts air. per minute. Counts per minute, yeah. And it was sustained uh, 165, 185 for a couple of days. 
uh, really big numbers per minute. Of course, when you add those numbers up over the whole day, they're frightening numbers. But just in a minute, um, and so they can't deny it much longer. They just can't deny. Oh, it you much know, I, I I I respectfully I suggest that these these criminal elements calling themselves government agencies can continue to deny it and will continue to deny it until hell freezes over. They'll just keep oh, yeah. repeating the same lie over and yeah. over and over again. <laughs> That's what they do. Yeah, that's what drives me crazy. It drives me crazy. Well, really me too. Drives me crazy. I mean, here's I science. Know. You don't stop. You don't stop. Well, here's science fact. All right, here are the here are the readings. So uh, we're just going to have to keep doing what we do. That's all we can do. Right. But expect them to be the most deceitful, devious, lying pack of scum you're ever going <laughs> to run into, because that's what they are. Well, like you said, I'm going to ratchet it up. I'm, I'm matching it up this time. I'm just, yeah, you give me two weeks off now to, to, to rebuild myself, get everything up for winter rides, uh, yeah. winter gear on and stuff like that, and I'm, I'm coming back with a vengeance. And so what I'm going to do is the volunteers in the newspaper will get them to deliver flyers into all the neighborhoods, all the businesses. <laughs> we'll drag people in there. I don't care. And if they want to grill me, they're going to have their chance at the end of each meeting. I'll give them an hour or two hours if that's what they want. I'll give them three hours if that's if that what they want. And i got 25,000 pieces of information with me on each computer. So <laughs> if I'm hooked up to that projector, I'll give them what they want. <laughs> and I'll give them, them the real data. Wow. No messing around. Yeah. yeah. No messing around. It's time to, it's time to do something. And now I you're going to try and do this in, in how many communities? Well, we're going to hit everything that we could find uh -huh. is the idea. So it'll be everything that we can find for right till spring. We'll just keep going. It'll be exhaustive. Uh, we'll come back down here. In fact, we're going to do desolation sound again and get some really high quality. We never had that good of a camera the last time. Right. So we're going to, we got new lenses and stuff. We're going to go back up and do that one again because there was a, uh, a lot of controversy over that, even though I got no concept of what, because every beach was named and then there was maps to it, and anybody can go there and check it themselves. <laughs> it wasn't like it was hard. It wasn't very hard to find access to it either. See, so uh, uh, they, there was a lot of controversy over that, and I'm going to do that again, just real hardcore for a couple of days and try it all new gear before we take off, and just to have another go at these people, because it's obvious that you know. If no one's going to come and debate you, if no one's going to come out and actually show that you're wrong in everything you're saying, could they, if they could do that, they would do that. Same with you. Right? If they could do that, they would do it to us. But they won't. They can't. They couldn't. And, of course, the industry won't let them because that would be stupid to come out <laughs> and try to hammer you or me. We can right. come out and rebuttal that to pieces, obviously. And like Yoshi, you know, he he doesn't hold any words, but he's so eloquent with it, that the people I do play those clips of uh, Yoshi and yourself, they really get it when they hear you guys, see? They, they, that's what I mean, right? That's, that's the power. Nice. Yeah. If you can get out there, then you know you can do. You can really change the game. Now tell us I about this this, uh, this thing you're going to participate in uh, via Skype. Where is that and, and who's putting that on? I haven't got it in front of me. Uh, okay. It's all arranged. That's a uni some of the university in Texas and they're, they're they were uh, motivated by what we were doing originally. Yeah. But right? you put that video up there, um, Polar Pacific Ocean did, which was, that was a lot of controversy. But, I mean, that was an accurate description. It wasn't 100% dead, but people said, oh, no, there's a few things alive, and you beat us up that way. But that that was defeating what we were showing, was 1% of 1% was there. And so that seemed to kickstart that one. And there's another institution Another university in Detroit, they're starting to put together a symposium, and they're going to have me in on Skype for a couple of days later. But at least that's a start. And if you can educate those kids and tell them the difference and ask them to try their best, that's a start. Everything's a start with me, every, every opportunity. Well, of course. But now I'm tired of that. I just want to go, and I'm going to trip up everything in my way, and I'm going to go tell the community myself. And if they can't, and I think they can, because eight out of ten can digest it, no problem, ask me pertinent questions to what mm -hmm. I was saying. They weren't distracted. They were mm -hmm. focused mm -hmm. and concerned and, and absolutely worried that this wasn't stopped. See, they were led to believe that it was stopped. My and God, it's getting worse and worse, as you know. It is. And that's, yeah. that's the part that they don't. 
See, most people, unfortunately, are so reflexively conditioned by the media that right. they say, okay, it's important, it's on the television, it's on the radio, it's in the press. <laughs> if it's not there, then you got a problem. And, and that's, yeah. that's the gap you have to bridge. Well, why isn't in the media? And these people who say, my God, if it was really bad, the government would tell us. They, they're hopeless. Uh, it's sad. Right. They yeah, have no, the I longest way to go. They're just out of the loop entirely. What else government tell us? Right. Yeah. That's yeah. the logic. It's not logic. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's reflex. They've been taught that their whole life. If you're sick, go to the doctor. I was doctor. like that years ago, yeah. Well, I was too. I was really like that myself. There's yeah. a learning so curve you got to go through. To one extent. It's Absolutely. hard to believe that the system is engineered to deceive you and to cause a devoid by giving them the wrong information and a little yeah. bit of good information. So when somebody tries to talk to them with the actual information, they'll say, oh, it's like a banana, it's nothing to worry about, it's like potato chips, or it's like walking in the sunshine. Ah, uh, it's and unbelievable. Like, oh, Are you yeah, still hearing whole... that banana story? I am. Oh, yeah, you're reading God. it. I'm still uh, finding it. The same players all the time, the yeah, same yeah. media. They manage to sneak it in there, and they're not apologetic about it, no one only bothers to fact check it. No, I know. What you ended up with is... I know. Hold on a second, Dana, we'll take a break, we'll come right back. Dana Dernford. Okay, let's see if we've got uh, connections back with uh, Yochi Shimatsu in Thailand. Are you there, Yochi? Well, I can hear you now, yeah. Uh, a little better line, yeah, huh? All Good. right, okay. Well, Dana's been going over his, his program. Okay. He's, sure. he's going to hit... Uh, yeah. as many communities as he can and go to the paper, put out flyers yeah. uh-huh. and hold a town, a kind of a town hall meeting and set up his equipment with his, his graphics and his images and challenge people politely with the truth. And he says eight out of ten up there are open and receptive to it, which is really good. Now you have to take it to the people. You have to. And he's doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, the Canadian people have, although not as free as the United States by any, by any regard, you know, I mean, it's still a Commonwealth country, it's still basically a crown colony, you know. Uh, they do have at least a limited, uh, right of speech and all that, and in their traditions of, of course, big country, widespread communities, uh, tends to have a lot of community control. So that's good, uh, excellent. Contrast with Japan, where, We've had a lot of problems with uh, the free speech issues with the national security law and a tradition that hasn't been really democratic since maybe the early 20th century, you know, the beginning of the month. So, huge difference. Anyway, uh, recently, are you still there? Can you hear me? Yeah, we got you. Go ahead. I'm not sure we still have a line. Yeah, okay, we do. Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, so a slew of stories, have got a slew of mentions have come out from scientists about the fact that the explosion that ripped... Uh, I blew the lid off of uh, Reactor 3 was probably some sort of nuclear explosion, not a hydrogen gas explosion. And, uh, but, you know, three and a half years on, it's just shocking that people who have even the rudiment of understanding of nuclear science won't mention the fact that it was probably a fusion reaction driven by the release of hydrogen from tritium. Now, the company Curion, you know, the water treatment company from Irvine, California, working at Fukushima, yeah. Uh, is trying to capture this, uh, free hydrogen that's released by tritium. Uh, of course, this will take a lot of years because huh. it's not just going to happen by itself. They're sitting, you put it in long tubes, right. long tubes in the ground and sort of cap it and collect the hydrogen, use that for gas or hydrogen automobiles. Uh, basically, uh, you know, these hydrogen fuel cells, uh, hydrogen fuel cells. It seems to, uh, the hydrogen uh, back to uh, water. Uh, Water and then you, know, you get fuel out of the process, energy out of the process. Yeah. It seems anyway, yeah. it seems like uh, a canard to me, uh, just a joke. I mean, they they've got proof that they can take regular tap water and yeah. crack it on the run and get hydrogen to propel yeah. a car. Yeah. And if you what do you have to go to to uh, Fukushima Daiichi and try to collect it coming out of the ground with tubes? This is nuts. Well, well yeah. Well, if you look at it this way, if you look at it, you get thousands of dollars in fees from uh, the Tokyo Electric Power Company, which comes from the taxpayer, to generate 
a few tens of thousands of dollars of hydrogen. It's absurd. And this will be declared gigantic success. Yeah, so, I know. Uh, yeah, of course, it's absurd, but it's a boondoggle. Yeah, it's a boondoggle, obviously. And it won't prevent... Uh, there's no safety guarantee for future explosions. Now, it just turned out there was a report released that uh, the Japan Atomic Energy Corporation, there's a fuel company that mm-hmm. makes uh, uranium and acquires plutonium, reprocesses uh, plutonium. Right. But they've been making secret uh, plants in Suruga. I, I was out there uh, the last time I was in Japan. Very to build, to build roadways. There are very wide highways for there. Uh, and this is near the town called Obama. You remember there was a Japanese town that became very famous because it has the same name as the president when he got elected. Well, near that place, very wide highways for the very scarce amount of traffic on the road. Obviously, to carry heavy equipment like uh, uh, rocket launchers, missile launchers, for example. You know, uh, these are yeah, defense security highways. Uh, Turuga is also a mock fuel plant, just like Reactor 3 and Reactor 4 was being converted for. So uh, this was back in 2009. So uh, even that early on, um, planning was well underway for uh, enrichment of already war-grade plutonium to higher grade for it's kind of a super plutonium bomb. Uh, uh, and uh, hydrogen, you know, the release of hydrogen from tritium is what triggers the bomb. And this is it's called a hydrogen bomb. So every mock reactor in the world, and there are many of them, there are dozens of them, is basically a, a, a controlled hydrogen bomb experiment, basically what it is. You've got your hydrogen bomb uh, in all the major countries of the world. So this is what we're up against. These revelations have just come out. And it seems that there's a split in the Japanese establishment now with the fall of Mrs. Obushi. Yuko Obushi is the new minister of economics who is in charge of watching over the nuclear plant. Why a woman? Why is she in charge? Well, her father was the one who merged Daiichi Kongo and Yasuda Bank. He's a, Daiichi Kongo was a Yakuza bank. And this is a bank that's the prime funder for the Tokyo Electric Power Company. The Tokyo Electric Power Company is very, very much linked with organized crime banking, okay? To, and, and obviously, uh, many of those people in organized crime were, were war veterans, part of the secret establishment. And this was all about nuclear bombs. You know, I mean, if anyone thinks nuclear energy is efficient, you really need to go see another branch of science called psychiatry because nuclear power is really about nuclear bombs. We all know that. When Iraq builds one, Iraq, no, their place gets bombed. When Iran builds one, they're accused of trying to make a nuclear bomb. Well, there's hundreds and, you know, of these reactors in the United States, 50 in Japan, a fixed point in Japan. Obviously, the, especially the higher grade ones uh, are especially aimed at nuclear bomb production. So, I think gradually, surely, but slowly, we're seeing that this was a military accident, not a civilian power accident. Yeah, military accident in Japan. And you just uh-huh. mentioned the military-industrial complex, well, and that would should. explain yeah. the yeah. cover-up, the, cover the pressure, the threat, well, this, this, so uh, the reluctance of scientists to stand out. <laughs> yeah, this cover-up is not going to end. Right. Uh, yeah. the, the government agencies over here and over there, and in Canada, too, will continue to lie and say whatever it is they're told to say. And as long as they keep lying and the media keeps repeating their lies, it becomes relatively easy to keep this yeah. in the background. And that's where it is right now. Actually, it's in the no ground. Uh, we're, it's not in the news at all anywhere. Are you seeing, Dana, any stories well, anywhere? Well, there's a panoply. Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. No, no, no. a no, no, no. of lies. The uh, <laughs> catastrophe that that, you know, that, that that filmmaker, the French filmmaker, was talking about this. Catastrophe, yeah, uh, is so widespread. It's, it's so global. It has so many effects on the weather, on the melting of the Arctic, on human health, on uh, food, basic land, food, land everywhere. You know, the radiation, on genetic changes, the mutations everywhere it spread. And as it spreads, more and more genetic mutations, genetic mutations in the human species, and 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 other more and possibly more important species than ours for the sustenance of life in forms of algae, for example, on which you know, uh, which create most of the world's oxygen. You know, we have yet to see the impact on tree species. That's going to take a long time. Uh, this unfolding catastrophe, which he, which he means is, is that you get different lists and 
it will have such a really cosmic impact on this planet. And that's what will happen if this planet suddenly, the atmosphere suddenly vanishes. You know, that's the, how much this atmosphere depends on life forces to maintain it. You know, the vast amount, you know, the trillions of tons of biomass that generates the oxygen and the gases to oh, yeah. maintain it. Yeah. We don't know. You know that's like I said, this, this could be endless. This could be, you know, uh, beyond anything. And yet, uh, what we're reading still is this thing happening in Copenhagen about warming. You know, I don't care about global warming in the sense that for it or against it, you know, yeah, there's, there's a factor out there, but uh, why is there not a confidence about those machines that are larger at the same UN, United Nations level as a threat much greater than anything uh, resembling global warming? Hmm. All right. Well said. Anyway. We just have about a minute left. Uh, Dana, uh, you're going to wrap it up for us this time. Yeah. Your your immediate schedule is what? Immediate schedule is two weeks, upload all the footage we already shot, and uh-huh. then winterize everything and get out of Dodge and get started again and keep all right. going. Okay. All right. Thanks for taking time tonight. Go uh, go curl up and get some sleep. We appreciate you, I will, as always. Good night, folks. Take you. Okay. Good night, Dana. All right, uh, Yochi, another week. Uh, Where are you going to be next week? Uh, We may have lost him. Are you there, Yochi? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we have to see. Okay, well, we'll we'll try to catch catch you up on everything and get it all down. Yeah. Yeah, uh, okay. A lot of things are happening in Japan below the surface. A lot of scientists are starting to trip out. So they we're are. gonna have to refocus on Fukushima after the Ebola hiatus is crazy. Ebola, Hong Kong, all the world is erupting, and you wonder if it's not all going crazy because of radiation. You have yeah. to wonder. You have to wonder. You do that okay? is okay, or it's not because of radiation. Because you need a diversion from radiation. Okay? No, I got it. Like it's a diversion. Anyway, yeah. very good. Yeah. All right. You take care. I'll talk to you next week. Okay. Next week. Okay. Hey. All right, there he goes. Uh, we apologize about the telecommunications lines, but we got through it. And uh, some brave people out there, indeed. Okay, we thank you for being here on this Monday, and we will be back with you tomorrow night. It's election night. We're going to talk about that a bit uh, with D.V. Kidd. We'll kind of tally things up, a left-right paradigm game, and all the rest of it. That's tomorrow night. Okay, so if uh, you are involved with voting, get out and vote tomorrow. And I hope you do vote and your candidate wins. And I hope the candidate will live up to his or her promises. That's the tough part. Okay, take care. Talk soon.